Welcome to the Two Blokes Chatting Radio Show on 94.7 The Pulse. Music, interviews, news and, well, two blokes chatting. Now, here are the two blokes. Yes, indeed, we do. A gentleman who's very been very kind to this show and others I've done over a long period of time, a uh, legend of the AFL officially, David Parkin. Good morning to you. Gentlemen, on this wet, windy, non-Melbourne GF. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, David, a very different feeling for you, and I, I don't like to uh, remind you of uh, your age, but 1949, you first went to the MCG with Dad to watch a grand final, and you've seen every one of the 72 since that day, but you won't be watching today's live. Um, funny feeling for you on a day like this? Well, it is because people like you keep reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only stat he knows, David. <laughs> no, I've come, to, I've come to grips with that to end at some stage, didn't I? What a phenomenal run I've been as a kid, as a Melbourne supporter, as growing up and loving my football. Then I happened to play in them and assistant coach and coach in them, I think. Uh, and I was, I was a broadcaster like you two blokes um, for a number with the, uh, with the ABC. So... Yeah, in, in multiple roles. How lucky I've been that when you think about it, uh, to have been uh, to successive ones since 1949. Apart from selling pies, you've just about every done every role. You haven't umpired one, have you? No, but I, I actually I was. Uh, yeah, that's interesting because I was for one. No, oh, for two, I was the uh, umpire's coach. So there you are. There's another. Uh, job that I was doing at that time. Uh, David, having spoken to you before, one of the great joys of your footy journey outside of winning premierships is is people you meet along the way. And you just mentioned off air that you ran into a few yesterday, and one of them will probably be listening this morning. Uh, good morning, Ian Cover, if you are punching up the highway again for another uh, episode of the Coulda Beans. But um, uh, just a, a great, great part of lot the footy world is the, is the wonderful people you get to meet, and you run into a few this week. Look, it, it's been my first time out for about eight or nine months. Uh, I picked Cove, Cove up. We walk each Friday morning, which has uh, been a delight for me. I, I listen, he talks. <laughs> and, uh, which is different because most people, he just talks. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, we, I picked him up right across the fines. So we had a beautiful lunch with the Lord Taverners, Geelong Lord Taverners. Um, lunch, I should say, a breakfast. And uh, to catch up with people there... Um, Robert Costa, who is a lovely bike, doing some terrific work at the Costas, uh, do in so many areas, particularly for disadvantaged people. For Andy Britton, who is the uh, local policeman down here at Geelong, unfortunately, I hear that he's left, but he's gone to Robert's uh, Foundation to help him in the work that they're doing. Andy Britton ran the um, Dakota program for. Kids are in a bit of strife uh, each year and that program has taken them on the walk and for kids to change their lives, etc. because the discipline's associated with it. I mean, there, it was just lovely in the room. Bob Merriman, of course, who ran Cricket Australia and is now the local mayor down here. There were so many people in the room that I'd had a um, know, sort of a, an association with uh, at some stage that... Uh, they're lovely to catch up, particularly when you've been in isolation for uh, eight or nine months. <laughs> uh, I, I was just mentioning also a, a, a lovely interview you did in the ABC a little while ago, and you mentioned running into an old footballing opponent who's a, another one of those Geelong legends, and that is uh, Gordon Hines, who left Geelong Footy Club and, and basically put the North Shore Football Club on the map, not only as a player, but as an administrator of the club. And you had a funny little story which caught my eye about running into him uh, post... It might be funny from your point of view, <laughs> but not from mine. I mean, I, I was... You've got to know the background to it. I was scarred for life. I still carry it. I still wake up. One of the few football moments that uh, really has stuck in my brain in a negative fashion was that I was the... Um, Hawthorne player who had, I think, two, four, seven goals kicked against him in the grand final in 1963, which Geelong, of course, won. I played on Doggan and Rice. They kicked two each, and in the last half played on Gordon Hines, who managed to kick three. <laughs> and I was driving out of my driveway. Well, this is probably a decade ago now, some time ago, and uh, out of my driveway in Hawthorne. 
and I got a bit of a fright because as I came through the gatepost, there was a man in the hole, the um, I mean, telecom communications bloke doing some work on the phone lines. And I got a bit of a fright because the car wasn't all that far away from me. He looked up and I looked down. He said, uh, are you who I think you are? And I said, are you who <laughs> He said, yeah, I'm Gordon Hines. And I kicked three goals in, in the second <laughs> Three grand final, and I said, "Well, Gordon, I'm going back in, and I'm coming out this time. And I'm going to drive into the hole." <laughs> so it was, um, it was a, it was a terrific catch up. And as you say, he's been uh, a wonderful. You know, um, you know, his post Geelong um, uh, part of footy has been a wonderful. Um, what's the word? Input to the game in so many different roles. So. We uh, we sat there and had a yarn for quite some time, living over old memories, most of which hurt me terribly. <laughs> I think that's one of the things, isn't it, David? A lot of people uh, don't, unless you've been in there, as you obviously have and we haven't. But, you know, you, you, we went along to an event uh, 18 months ago, I reckon. Rob and I were fortunate enough to get along to a, uh, an event that uh, John Bird organises with uh, former Premiership players, and they recognise a, uh, a, a, a you know a, a legend of the game. And we had Bob Skilton sitting on our table, and Ron Barassi on our table, and there was all these people sitting around, and they're the very best of mates. Like you went into battle yeah. literally, and and now all these years later, people are just really really close friends. And that's one of you say that because on Monday, uh, John Bird, who lives in Anglesey. Mm-hmm me here in Point Lonsdale, we're having breakfast together in Torquay on Monday. So there, there, there's that connection that's remained forever. And you're quite right. I'm, I'm pleased that you say that because most football followers, and we're all pretty biased about our teams, etc. But there is a fraternity which um, I'm so proud to be a part of who look after and support, take interest in and care of, and they have for the last, it's in my life, the last 50 or 60 years. Yeah, it's good and peace pass on regards to John, who has been on this show a couple of times and uh, we enjoy his company. He, he told a funny story about playing against John Newnham and he, he and John yeah. were, were that close yeah. that they would go out and dine together each time uh, Essendon played yeah. Fitzroy. They'd dine together on the Saturday night. Just unheard of stuff. But uh, I, I dislike them both intensely. Yeah. <laughs> Methodically, John Newman and John Burt couldn't catch the little bees. I couldn't catch them at all and they kept kicking goals. So... I didn't have the same view of them that you did. <laughs> uh, David, you have seen 72. Is there a, is there a grand final that, that is head and shoulders above or slightly above all of the others in your memory? Well, I think, like most people, the 89 Hawthorne Geelong grand final was probably... It sits in my memory as a game and the incidents, etc. within it. Um, I think that probably... I mean, other than the ones... I mean, I was lucky enough to play and captain one, uh, which without doubt is the fondest memory and the most enjoyable one that uh, you're actually out there doing it. I can't say that about coaching them because you ask the coaches and I think most would say it's just a dreadful time of pressure and decision making which you have no absolute control over. So you sit there in a very prayerful way hoping that what was trained for and... uh, um, prepared for actually becomes the reality. So it, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I love happening one and playing in one. Um, I, know I was half a reasonable player, although um, I was still waiting. John, I lost my great mentor on John Kennedy just a few months ago, but the, the story goes that I got a phone call probably five or six years ago now from Don Scott. I'm one of his four friends, I think. Um, he uh, <laughs> he rang me to tell me, just had a phone call from John Kennedy to tell him how well he played in the 1971 grand final. And I couldn't believe it. Because we're all, we're all waiting for him to put his arm around us and tell us, well done. Well, I'm, that never happened to me. But here he's rung Don Scott, and Don was so excited. And he's, he rung his mates, and uh, and I congratulated him. And I got the phone, I thought, no, nah. I rang JK. John, um, I just want you to know how significant the phone call you made this morning was to Don Scott. I said he was just so excited, and I want to say that's one of the better things you've done in your life. Oh, Dave, he said. uh, (laughs) I couldn't sleep, and I uh, got out of bed, and I turned the television on, and I actually watched the 1971 grand final for the first time ever, which would have been right. He would never have done it. Hmm. And he said, I couldn't believe how well the boy played. So I thought I'd give him a call and tell him. I said, well, look, 
John, it, it is it's fantastic. I'm so pleased. You're, oh, I don't realise. I said, look, John, have you got my telephone number? <laughs> he said, well, yes, I do, Dave. I said, well, look, when I hang up, can you give me a call and tell me how well I played the 1971 Grand Final? Won't be making that call, Dave. We didn't play all that well. <laughs> <laughs> it is a ripper. <laughs> Now, now, Parco, based on the fact that you've seen a fair bit of uh, tally this year watching footy, you've seen Richmond and Geelong, you've watched the way the game's been umpired, you know that the venue, possible weather conditions, has today got the potential to be the best grand final you've ever seen? I think it has. And uh, what amazed me, guys, was the in the wet or dew or whatever it was the other night, I can't remember, it was a preliminary final of a week before, you wouldn't, if you'd been an un bias, didn't know, wasn't interested, you picked it up and started to watch it, you would believe that they were playing with a dry ball. I think the skill level, it, despite the conditions, has been remarkable in my mind. So I don't know that the conditions are going to change all that, but I think the chaotic nature of the manner which Richmond play and the physicality which they attach to that or deliver it with probably puts them in the, in the favouritism spot. But I, like most others, love the way that Geelong play in a more controlled game. And I'm just hoping, like heck, and I'm sort of in the area down the Ballerine down here, I hope that Geelong, because they've been there for a long, long time over the last decade, the best, sorry, the most consistent performing team, you'd like to think they might be rewarded um, tonight. I've got my fingers crossed they will. But I think Richmond will probably should start favourite. Yeah, well, as a Brisbane Lions man, David, uh, it would make it just a tiny, tiny bit better if the team that tossed us out last week was the one that ended up winning. Yeah, yeah it's a bit sad, really, because I, like you, I've got a strong relationship with Fags, who's one of my great, great mates, and uh, I was hoping, as my son works for Port Adelaide, I was hoping that um, he's recruited all those young blokes who soon to be going all right. I, like many, was hoping it would be a Port Adelaide-Brisbane final. But I think in both cases, they're the immature bodies, not the method mm. or the talent, probably didn't allow them to survive. But watch out in 221. Yeah. yeah. Well, particularly if they can enhance their forward line with a chap called Danaher. Uh, releasing Eric Hipwood to be, I reckon, a once-in-a-generation wingman. Watch my watch this space, I reckon. Yeah, well, that's absolutely true. I hadn't even thought about that. I, think, I hope you're sowing that seed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> next time you're talking to Fags, two messages. One, get yeah. Hipwood onto the wing. And two, <laughs> ask him whether he's got my phone number because we've got a Saturday morning program that's not going to have a lot of footy to talk about. So. I know he would. No, he would do it for you. Oh, he absolutely would. I've, I've been, I'm a, a player sponsor, so I've met him a few times and I just haven't had the courage to ask him. But uh, uh, No, no, you'd have the courage because he's one of the finest people, the most giving people I've met in my whole time in footy. Yeah, he's, uh, I'm he's on the phone man. to him on Monday. <laughs> now, I can give you a weather forecast. I'm going to do my very best Lavinia Nixon for you. Um, it's going to peak at 27 degrees in Brisbane today around 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. It is then proceeding to, well, these are the percentage likelihoods of rain. At midday, 80%, then 80%, 40%, 60%. It'll drop off to about 22 by the time the game starts. There's expected to be rain from 7 through till 8 and from 9 through till 10. So it will be a wet surface, you would think. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 David. I want to go back to the umpiring. You had a couple of years of uh, mentoring those, um, and I and I must admit, of well, the last time we had you on, we we're a little bit critical of where the game was going. But like the footballers and the football teams, the cream rises to the top. But I reckon generally the game has been umpired very well during the final series, and I'm expecting that to continue today. Is is that your reading of it as well? Look, I'm a bit biased, Matt Stevick was a graduate student of mine and I became a mentor of, I think that's what he calls me but and uh, talked to him regularly, have twice this week already and he said that there's been a, a a better understanding of what needs to be done at this time with a shorter game, more vigorous um, approach to it, players aren't getting as tired etc uh, in one sense he said it's been the most difficult period in his time in footy uh, because of the intensity of the game but their ability to not blow the whistle too quickly and to allow things to eventuate from what look like impossible situations. I think that's been a, a maturity in a short period of time that the umpires have, what's the word, grabbed hold of, adopted and gone with. And I think, like you, look, it's, you know, we talk about the most difficult game in the world to play and probably to coach, but 
there is no doubt in my mind, I think probably in yours too, that this Australian ga- game is the most difficult game in the world to umpire. So let's have a little bit of, um, what's the word, uh, ease in terms of criticism and uh, I hope they are able to survive. Matt gets very nervous and he always gets the first bounce because he's the best bouncer in the uh, in the game. Uh, I wouldn't like to be in their position, so I hope the game's played in a manner which will never be easier to umpire, but will be easier to umpire than some that we've seen this year. Another area that um, we've got to be a bit sensitive to um, the, the topic, and that is coaching. We've seen the sad news this week about Reese Shaw and the obvious pressures being built up on coaches and with the elimination of some of the roles, assistant coach roles because of cost at the moment yes. um, it must be a, a, a role that you know the, the pressure, none of the tasks have dropped away, just the number of people doing them it must just be a phenomenally difficult thing to be doing at the moment Look I think that's a very good uh, summation, I know a few, obviously Brett Ratton one of my closest mates and uh, I sense from their discussions and communication that what you're saying is absolutely right. I think the clubs and the local one down here, the Geelong Football Club, have led the way in that. I think in employing people whose specific role is to look after the mental health, if you like, of the um, staff and particularly the coaches and, of course, the players too, has become at least a vital component in who you employ and your uh, system of welfare within your footy club the good thing about it is that uh, the clubs that have succeeded most over the last um, decade, Geelong Hawthorne and Sydney have led the way in terms of the number and quality of the support staff who are looking as a major focus for their employment is on the, if you like, the physical well, or more the mental health of the playing and support groups. So I think we've at least, now we're talking about it, we've done something about it, so I hope that we continue vigorously all clubs down that particular line when they can afford the resources, and I think it should be high priority, that we can understand that the role it must play. I mean, it just highlights the young North Melbourne coach is um, the end product of a very, very difficult task um, to achieve and the end result I mean I, I when I got sacked I think I went under when I was sacked at the end of my Fitzroy uh, term and uh, it, it, it is a difficult task when you're on your own and there's no support I certainly went off and uh, sought um, assistance, professional assistance which at the time for me was absolutely critical yeah, just on, on that too, David. You you were quite famous in handing the reins over to Wayne Britton and and taking a back seat, which probably started a little bit of a, a trend. But I was stunned on two occasions this year in press conferences. Chris Scott has diverted a question about a particular part of the Geelong ground to the to the line coach, if you like, because he said he would know more about that than me. That that sort of staggered me at the time. But I guess the way the game has changed now, if Matthew Scarlett looks after the defenders, well, Chris Scott is comfortable that Matthew Scarlett is looking after the defenders. And that, that's it. Yeah, and I, I think what was nice, um, a coach the other night talked about the improvement with, with the Richmond coach, was I talked about the improvement of stoppages and gave young Kingsley the due kudos. So why don't yeah. you up? They're obviously doing the daily work and the changes. You talked about Scarlett there, the changes that have been brought about through the specialisation and influence of somebody else other than the senior coach. His job's really a management job of those coaches there doing the work. I just was delighted when coaches are, I'm oh, sorry, clubs are looking for coaches and they're looking for commendation from uh, senior coaches about their assistance, make, help, help them to make their decision if you like. Uh, I was absolutely delighted to hear publicly a senior coach come out and say, well, this change, we got better at this where we've been very ordinary because Adam Kingsley has, uh, it, it has done X, Y or Z. And I thought, oh, it's so good to see it. And I, I think the, uh, you know, it's been a bit disappointing for me, the John Warsfold story. You know, Johnny's a great mate of mine. And I know the succession plan he put into place. And people in the media ought to know better because I don't understand it and I don't think that people have the, 
courage and whatever it is, commitment to lose their own job and give it to somebody else. I don't understand that because they couldn't do it themselves. Mm. And uh, I was I'm really annoyed that the succession plan idea uh, should have gained legs, multiple legs, many times before it has, because it's still the best way in life, in business, in education, in sport. It is the best way to make the change from one leader to another by putting in succession plans, but we've been very slow in this country to adopt that attitude. Yeah, a bit of uh, ego is not a dirty word. Um, <laughs> I'll pop in there, David. And, of course, uh, some discussion at North Melbourne that uh, someone coming into a mentoring-type role is one of your protégés in the world of coaching as well, a, chap, a young fellow that I went to school with, Paul Ruse. Yeah, well, and I think that's a smart way of start not giving him the actual responsibility of the day-to-day stuff but bringing someone in who can support a new coach coming into what is going to be the most difficult role that has been presented to a coach in AFL football for a long, long time. Yeah, definitely. Uh, David, thank you so much again for your time. You always take us to places we weren't expecting. You've done it again today, and uh, we wish your wish you luck today in your new role as a uh, armchair watcher of the grand final this evening. And uh, I hope it does become one of the classics again. And uh, I, yeah. I like the fact that Geelong as you pointed out, play a style of footy that makes you proud to watch. And uh, regardless of the result, we Geelong supporters will be very proud. Thanks again for your time. Keep up the good work.